Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Lewis Lake. It's good to be together in any way that we're able to be. And so we're thankful that you have joined us this morning. Uh, spring is springing, and the warm weather is on the way. Things are greening up. Summer's coming, and uh, it's nice. It uh, encourages my heart anyway and lifts my spirits. Uh, this this time of year, we don't get that many really great days in Minnesota that aren't too hot or too cold, so we'll take the ones that we get, and this is about the time of year that we get those. A couple of announcements to run by you. We're still looking for some graduation pictures, so uh, parents particular, if you've got a graduating senior, uh, if you could round up 10 pictures of your graduate, um, you know, find that cute cute baby one, the embarrassing ones from second grade and so forth, and round those up and get those to Tammy at the office so that we can uh, celebrate and slightly embarrass your graduate. We always look forward to doing that every year. We're always excited uh, to welcome new babies here at Lewis Lake, and so we're excited to announce the birth of uh, little Theodore, and uh, congratulations to Emily and Colton Johnston. Little Theodore arrived on May 8th. Uh, at the perfect sizing of 7 pounds, 10 ounces, and 19 inches long. So if you get a chance to reach out and say uh, congratulations to Emily and Colton and, uh, and join us in uh, celebrating the arrival of little Theodore and look forward to being able to see the little guy and uh, check him out for ourselves and uh, watch the gals of Lewis Lake fight over him. That's always a, a real treat. I also want to mention that uh, our May newsletter is out, and if you'd like a copy of that uh, mailed to you, just shoot a uh, call or an email into the office, and we will get that sent out to you. Confirmation students, Pastor Bob has put out a video to connect with you. We're doing some distance confirmation, so if you're in second year confirmation, uh, make sure that you check that email that you got, and the video is also uh, posted on our Lewis Lake a YouTube channel, so if, if any of you want to see what on earth happens uh, in a confirmation class, check that out. Uh, Pastor Bob is covering some good stuff there, and so check that out. And then while you're at YouTube looking up that video on our Lewis Lake channel, uh, hit the subscribe button, and uh, we would appreciate that the, uh, if we get a certain number of subscribers that uh, opens up some kind of fun options for us to do on YouTube. So, um, just a few announcements as we get rolling. We're going to be talking this morning about the identity of the Lord Jesus, and as we do so, we will begin with a call to worship uh, in which Jesus identifies himself in a rather powerful way. He says this in Revelation 1, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And we are gathered here uh, together online, even here uh, at the church this morning, to worship this once dead, now living Savior who has the keys of death and Hades, and we are thankful for that. Uh, Michelle is going to uh, start us off with a song to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord together.
my favorite speeches uh, from the movies comes from The Wizard of Oz, The Cowardly Lion. Do you, rem do you remember this? What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast a wave? Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dusk? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hot and top so hot? What puts the ape in apricot? What have they got that I ain't got? Courage. You could say that again. Hmm? <laughs> I love The Wizard of Oz. It's one of the most quotable movies uh, of, of all time. I want to add to our little string of meditations this morning, these little moments when we try to think our way carefully and biblically through the specific and strange situation we find ourselves in and, and roll around some ideas with you about courage. This is not a sermon, technically speaking. It's just a meditation. I'm just pondering. I'm just thinking my way through this with you this morning. And if you were to go back in this string of meditations several weeks ago and listen to those, you would hear Pastor Bob and I talk about how we shouldn't be afraid in these days. And why on earth would we say such a thing as that? After all, fear is uh, one of, uh, a gift from God. It's a useful feeling. God has given to us like pain. It's unpleasant, but it's, it's useful. Uh, fear can keep us from all kinds of harm. How does it do that? What does fear do? Well, Fear paralyzes us. When we're afraid, we tend to, tend to freeze. We tend to stop moving because we, we, we know that we're kind of safe where we are, but we're just not sure if the next step is safe, and that's fine. It's, it's fear that makes us stop and look both ways before we cross the street, and, and I'm all for that. Uh, I try to teach my kids to do that. I kind of forget sometimes because I don't live on a street. But uh, any, anyway... Um, if fear is the only thing that we ever feel, we'll find ourselves permanently paralyzed. So looking both ways before you cross the street is good. Uh, looking both ways twice is, is okay. I'm not sure it's twice as good as looking once, but looking twice is okay. Looking both ways a hundred times before we cross the street is actually not very good at all because the person who never moves from, from looking to walking, never gets across the street. So we have to learn to control our fear so that fear doesn't control us because we are slaves of whatever controls us. And fear is a helpful friend, but it is also a very cruel master. The Bible talks in Hebrews 2 about how the devil enslaves people under the fear of death. And so if we go through life with one goal and one goal only, don't die, and not only will we fail at life, but because we all die, <laughs> we're going to find ourselves going through life not doing anything particularly courageous. And that's kind of a tragedy in itself. So if you think about the people you admire, uh, the people we admire the most almost always are courageous people. They're people that faced fear and acted anyway. The dictionary defines courage as the ability to do something that frightens one. So young David faces down Goliath, and we celebrate his courage. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand up to a king and get tossed into a fiery furnace. Daniel gets pitched into a lion's den, and we tell the stories of their courage. And we tell them in Sunday school because we want our kids to be able to face really scary things like giants and furnaces and lions and not always be paralyzed by them or run away from those things. We tell stories about Paul and Silas in prison, of the Apostle John being boiled in oil. We tell the tradition of Peter crucified upside down. 
of Christians who are torn to death by lions in the Colosseum. We, we tell the story of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, of bishops Latimer and Ridley being burnt at the stake by Bloody Mary. I love the stories of William Carey and Amy Carmichael facing tremendous danger and suffering great harm while doing great things for God in the country of India. We celebrate our soldiers who face enemy fire. We celebrate our medical personnel who work long hours around infectious diseases. We have this deep-seated, unstoppable admiration for courageous people who stare into the face of danger and, and don't flinch, and they even move ahead. We admire them because they inspire us to act courageously. That's why we make songs about Davy Crockett and erect statues of Martin Luther King. That's why our school mascots are lions and mustangs and bombers and dragons and not marshmallows and kittens and chickens. Uh, we, we aspire to courage. But courage doesn't come automatically, and courage doesn't come easily. If it did, everybody would do it, and everybody doesn't do it. And one of the reasons is that fear really is paralyzing, and fear keeps us from doing courageous things. But it's also worth remembering that courage, which we admire, is actually kind of close to reckless stupidity, which we despise, and sometimes it's really hard to tell them apart. So Solomon says in Proverbs 14, one who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. And Solomon also says in another place in Ecclesiastes 11, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So on the one hand, recklessness will kill you. On the other hand, if you wait for the perfect day to plant, you'll never get the crops in. And if you wait for the perfect day to combine, you'll starve. So, we wrestle through these things. Is it courageous or stupid for two soldiers in a war to leave camp in the middle of the night without permission, sneak behind enemy lines just to get their general a cup of water from his favorite well, even though he's got plenty of water already? Well, when a couple of David's best soldiers did just that, David considered it courageous. And we read that story and we admire those guys. Is it courageous or stupid when someone you love is unjustly arrested and you put your life on the line fighting for your friend? Well, Peter did just that thing in the garden. Pastor Bob talked about this uh, last week, he took on something like 600 to 1 odds. He was happy to go down swinging to rescue Jesus, and Jesus told him, knock it off. And we read that story and conclude that Peter was kind of a reckless doofus. So, so this is complicated, isn't it? And we're living in complicated days on any given day, there's a lot of reasons to be fearful, and we're facing a new reason that we've not encountered before. And really, our entire world has been paralyzed for a couple of months now. It's, it's kind of like the entire globe has come to a grinding halt. And that's fitting. That's appropriate in dangerous times. We don't want our next steps to be reckless, but it's also not fitting to be paralyzed indefinitely. If you're really antsy, it takes courage to be patient and still. If you're timid, it takes courage to act boldly. We all, we all have our fears, and actually those who fear nothing are, are fools. It's kind of like we're collectively standing on a sidewalk. We know at some point we need to cross the street. We know that doing so could be incredibly dangerous. We're not exactly sure even what the danger looks like. And on top of that, uh, on this road, there might be invisible cars. 
We know that some people will cheer us if we stay on the sidewalk. Some are going to cheer us if we cross the street. Some are going to criticize us if we stay. Some are going to criticize if we cross. But part of being courageous is being willing to take an unpopular stand. The courage of Rosa Parks comes to mind, or if you want a biblical example, King Asa in Second Chronicles 15. Now, in, in times of paralysis, when we're frozen by fear, one of the things that happens is our minds go like crazy. And, and yours and mine have been for a couple of months now. The Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. So we think, and we think hard, and we think deeply, and we try to think Clearly, in foggy days, we try to make sense of the danger, the danger to ourselves, the danger to other people. We ponder the danger of doing something, and we ponder the danger of doing nothing. We try to pursue wisdom. We listen to what our fears are saying, and we try to figure out which fears are worth listening to and which fears need to be overcome. We try to figure out the Thing that needs to be done, the best way to do it, and as the saying goes, come hell or high water, we take heart and do what needs to be done. When Moses was handing over the leadership of the nation over to Joshua, God told Moses, make sure you encourage Joshua, make sure you put courage in him. And so Moses actually does that four times in Joshua chapter 1. Moses says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Be strong and courageous. So what, what does courage look like for us in this hour? Well, I can't tell you what Courage looks like for you. Courage looks different for different people, and we're still swimming in rather murky waters. You need to figure out before the Lord what courage looks like. But I do want to encourage you not to be afraid. I want to encourage you to take heart, to be courageous. I do want to encourage you to do, or at least be willing to do, something that is frightening not because the something is frightening, but because sometimes the right thing to do is frightening. I especially want to encourage you, young men, to take courage in, in days like today when particular courage is needed. We almost always turn to young men to provide it. You, you young men... Uh, Almost by nature, you live on that razor's edge between lunacy and bravery, between being idiots and being heroes. It's almost impossible to tell that apart sometimes. But that's, that's by God's design, and we want to celebrate that, and we want to encourage more of that. But people of God, take heart, take courage, not recklessness, not foolishness, but courage. Don't be overcome by fear, but overcome fear by the strength that God provides, knowing that if we fear God above all else, we really do have nothing to fear, and properly fearless people are incredibly courageous. So take heart and take courage. I'd like to take a moment just to pray with you and for you as we... Uh, Ask the Lord to make us wise and courageous people. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that no circumstance has come upon us, but that you are aware of it, that you have purpose in it, and that you will direct us through it. And so we pray, Lord, that you would make us wise people in difficult days. And we pray that you would give us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Lord, make us courageous people. Courageous because we trust in you. 
Help us to grow as we wrestle. Lord, we recognize that the greatest growth in our lives comes in moments of tremendous difficulty. It comes uh, in moments when we have the most to fear. And so we pray that you would help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our faith would grow as we learn to grapple with all the things that we are afraid of and learn to uh, move forward courageously uh, in your sight. Thank you for the care that you have taken of us during these months. We pray that it would continue. We pray that you would open up doors to share the gospel, to share the hope of Christ. Lord, thank you that we can look even at the grave and say, oh, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? We serve a risen Christ. And what a joy it is for us. Thank you for the privilege of being together, of thinking together, of, of moving through difficult periods in life together. What a blessing the saints are, the, the people of God. And so we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to prepare our hearts to hear about the message of the identity of Christ, I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 53. This will be our scripture reading for this morning. And, and you'll notice in these verses a, uh, a failure to recognize who Jesus is. And so follow along with me. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? This is the unchanging and perfect word of God for us this morning. I'm going to invite Clark and the band to come and uh, sing a song uh, with us and for us uh, before Pastor Bob comes to preach. When peace like a
thank you, uh, Clark and Ben, for uh, leading us in worship today. As we uh, read that scripture reading from Isaiah 53, we were, in effect, putting our eyes on Jesus, trying to uh, understand who, just who he is. The early church spent a lot of time doing that very thing. Not so much thinking, how can Jesus help me in my life, but who is Jesus and what is crucial to understand about him? And there were reasons why they did that. We're all familiar with the Apostles' Creed, one of the basic statements of faith in Jesus Christ. As time went by, the early church thought more deeply about Jesus, and they came up with another creed called the Nicene Creed. And in that, it kind of sounds like the Apostles' Creed. It says, for instance, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. So that kind of sounds like the Apostles' Creed, right? But in the next section that deals specifically with Jesus, listen to how deeply they pondered just who Jesus is, what is his nature, what is he like, that, that we can understand this Messiah that came to save us. And so listen to this just as I read. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So you can see they expanded that section about Jesus in such a way that they really piled phrase upon phrase to really understand the identity of Jesus. God from God, light from light. All right, so he's God from God. Jesus is God and he comes from God. But then they add uh, true God from true God, trying to make the point even more, and so forth and so on. Begotten, not made. He's the only begotten son, but he's not a created creature of God, and so forth. So this is the uh, Nicene Creed, and it really works hard to get at the identity of Jesus, who he is. And why is it important to understand exactly who he is? That's what we want to talk about today as we turn our hearts to our text for our message um, in Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 57. Matthew chapter 26, I encourage you to have your Bible open. We're going to work our way bit by bit through this text this morning as an act of setting our minds and our hearts upon Jesus Christ as an act of trying to understand deeply who he is and what he has done for us. And so let's uh, turn to that. And as we begin, let me begin with a word of prayer. Oh Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts to your word this day and that you would open your word to our minds that we might be quickened in faith and we might see Jesus in a greater way than we ever have before, that we can worship him, that we can rely upon him for our complete salvation. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless it to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our world today is filled with famous people. And uh, when, whenever somebody is famous, you see the public version of them. And we're always left wondering, what are they really like? I was just reading this morning in the paper uh, uh, a story about Johnny Depp. 
Johnny Depp is uh, going to court and he is suing a, a newspaper for libel, I guess, something of that nature. And there were witnesses that were brought forward, former uh, people that he was in relationship with, and they were testifying before the court that Johnny Depp was a nice guy, that Johnny Depp was not abusive, he didn't have anger issues, so forth and so on. This all built into his case. So you see, even today, as we look at somebody like Johnny Depp, we, we know him, we're familiar with him, he's famous. But what is he really like when you get him all by himself? If you were to hang around him, if you were to be part of his clan for a while, what kind of guy is he really deep down? Well, today, Jesus is under the microscope. He is on trial. And the judge is going to discover what Jesus is really like. And I hope we will too in some greater way. Let's read our text, shall we? Verse 57 of Matthew 26. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered, and Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now, in verse 59, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two men came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you. So let's go back to the beginning of that, work our way through it. Having arrested Jesus out in the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord is now taken by these men to a guy by the name of Caiaphas, who is the high priest. And there were other Jewish officials there too that made up the Jewish court called the Supreme Court, called the Sanhedrin. And uh, we have a short little notice here that Peter followed along with, waiting to see the end or to see how it all turned out. And in verse 59, Jesus is now put on trial. And as we look at that, Matthew leaves no doubt in our minds whatsoever that this court was up to no good. Notice in verse 59, it says, uh, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. The court was seeking false witnesses. Literally, it says pseudo martyria. Pseudo means false. We use that in English, and martyria means witnesses. We get our word martyr from that. And Matthew says they were looking for false ones. Now, I don't know. Why would, why would you do this? I'm deliberately going out and looking for people who will tell us a lie. That's kind of how this comes across. I don't know if Matthew makes it sound that way. Perhaps he... Uh, in his opinion, feels, Matthew does, that anybody who would say anything against Jesus has to be a false witness because there is no fault in Jesus whatsoever. 
But it's clear from Matthew that he leaves us no doubt the purpose of this trial was to put Jesus to death. This was not an effort to try to say, what is this guy claiming? Let's see if he really is who he is. That wasn't the case at all. The desire was we have to kill this guy and we're going to use the legal system as a weapon to do that, as our tool to get rid of Jesus. Now in verse 60, we have an interesting statement here. They were looking for these pseudo-martyria, these false witnesses, but it says in verse 60, they found none. But oddly, right after that, it says, though many false witnesses came forward. So what does it mean? They have a whole bunch of false witnesses, but they found none. You know, which is it? The fact of the matter is that the Jewish council was governed by the Old Testament law, specifically at this point. And the Old Testament law required that nobody could be condemned unless there were at least two Witnesses in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says this, a single witness shall not suffice, suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall, shall a charge be established. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. So there the law required at least two, and it would be better to have three witnesses if anybody is going to be condemned. And this is how Jewish court happened. There, we see examples of this in the Old Testament. When King Ahab looked out his window and saw a beautiful vineyard, for some reason, he grew in a, a huge desire in his heart to have it, but it was, it was governed, or I mean it was owned, by a guy named Naboth. And so he asked to buy it from Naboth, but Naboth says, I can't sell you the family farm. This is, property is in my family. And so he wouldn't sell it to him. And Naboth grew, or uh, rather Ahab grew more and more desirous of having this, and he couldn't get it. Finally, his wife Jezebel says, this is no problem, Ahab. Let's have a trial. We'll find a couple of false witnesses, and then we'll get rid of Naboth. And that's what happens in 1 Kings 21, uh, in verse 13, it says this. <coughs> Excuse me. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite him. Here, in, in Matthew, he calls them false witnesses. Here they're just called worthless men. And it says, and the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. So you see, that's all it took. If you can get two witnesses to agree in their testimony, then you can do anything. You can get rid of anybody you want. Caiaphas' problem with Jesus, he could find all kinds of witnesses, false ones, but he couldn't find two that agreed. Everyone came in and had a little bit of a different angle on it. They could not find two witnesses that agreed. And so what is he going to do? Finally, in verse, the last part of verse 60, he gets a little something. Uh, it says, at last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. So here's the charge. They bring up Jesus' claim about if you tear down this temple, I'll build it up in three days, which actually didn't refer technically to the real temple, but to the resurrection and Jesus' body being destroyed and raised up in three days. But uh, even if this were true, literally, it actually is not a crime to say this, at least not a crime worthy of death. So this charge that these false witnesses brought forward didn't deserve the death penalty in the first place. 
But, he, but this was Caiaphas's inn. He finally had two that had some sort of substantive uh, charge and, and witness together against Jesus. And so Caiaphas uses it to shift gears. He's going to stop trying to come up with more witnesses, and he is going to go after Jesus uh, in some other matter. So in verse 62, as we think about getting right down now to Jesus and his identity as the greater Messiah, notice in 62 it says, And the high priest stood up. Now that's weird. Have you ever seen Judge Judy stand up on TV? I don't know. <laughs> I don't watch Judge Judy. <laughs> but but um, my guess is usually judges don't stand up when, they're, when the court is going on. They sit. They're sitting in the seat of judgment, and it's the lawyers who stand up. But here, Caiaphas stands up. So that's kind of weird. And he goes on to say, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And so Caiaphas seeks to elicit a response from Jesus. He tries to get Jesus to say something. And he says, here's two guys. They have this accusation. Don't you have any response? But it says in verse 63, but Jesus remained silent. Jesus remained silent. I wish I could have been there and looked at it because I think I would have added something that Matthew leaves out. I would have put in, but Jesus remained silent, rolling his eyes. Okay? I mean, I, I think Matt, uh, Jesus looks at Caiaphas at this point, kind of rolls his eyes. <laughs> he said, really? This is it? This is the best you can do? you seriously going to try to get at me with, with this kind of thing? And so Jesus remained silent because this did not warrant a response. As we said earlier, this was not a charge that would carry the death penalty for sure, and this was something that was intended in a completely different way. So Jesus does not honor it even with a response. Well, uh, at this point, Caiaphas is really frustrated, and so he pulls out his biggest weapon. He pulls out his biggest tool from the toolbox. It says in verse 63, And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. I, I adjure you, he says. What does it mean to adjure somebody? Well, to adjure under oath is really to demand with all the authority that one possesses that the person should tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So Caiaphas is saying, I am the high priest. I'm the head of the Sanhedrin. I don't know if he was, but let's pretend. Uh, I am the, uh, the chief authority in Israel, and I demand that you respond, and here's the question, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Caiaphas says, I want you to state clearly whether or not you think you are God's promised Messiah. That's what Christ means. Christ means Messiah. In the Old Testament, God had pr promised that he would send a Savior. Uh, they called him Messiah to bring salvation to God's people and so Caiaphas says, are you that guy? Are you, the one, are you claiming to be the one that God has sent? And then uh, even more clearly, he says, are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? Which kind of takes it to another level. So Caiaphas is demanding ultimate clarity. No word games, no trickery, no title switches. He didn't want Jesus to say, well, we're all messiahs in a way, if we're faithful to God, aren't we? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a messiah. No, no. Are you the messiah? And, and even to say, are you the son of God, messiah? 
really getting specific. I want you, Jesus, to tell me exactly what you are claiming here. Now in verse 64, put under this super oath by Caiaphas, Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, you have said so. (laughs) Jesus manages to get one little weird statement in there that Caiaphas isn't sure. He said, well, you say I'm the Messiah. That's what you're calling me. So yeah, you're right. You're right about that, Caiaphas. I am the Messiah. But then he goes on to add to it, and he says, But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven, so forth. Jesus goes on to say much more than what Caiaphas was asking Caiaphas was saying, are you this promised Messiah? Jesus said, yeah, I'm that, and more than that. From now on, he says, from this point on. Remember earlier we had said Jesus stops his teaching now, and he goes and and he enters into his death on the cross and resurrection and so forth. And Jesus is saying here, from this point on, you are going to see me sitting right next to God sitting on God's right hand, which is his hand, right hand of power, the, the place of ultimate authority. And he says, you're going to see me coming in the clouds. Coming in the clouds. What Jesus is doing is he is hearkening back to the greatest son of man. Son of man was the title Jesus took. And Jesus now points back to Daniel chapter 7, And he picks up the imagery because Daniel saw a vision that this Messiah was coming from God in the clouds. One like the Son of Man, it says. And Jesus says, you see the guy that Daniel was talking about? That's me. I'm coming in the clouds. I'm at the right hand of power. It was not technically blasphemous to claim to be the Messiah. A lot of people claim to be the Messiah. There was a sense in which a person could even claim to be the Son of God. We're all sons and daughters of God. But what Jesus had just declared went far beyond this. Yes, Jesus says, I am the promised Messiah come to save the world. And yes, I am the divine Son of God. Now, as we go from here, this is where things get helpful for you and I. Because let's talk about the reaction that Jesus now gets as he has made this audacious claim. Caiaphas was looking for a piece of evidence that would seal his case against this troublesome imposter. But he got more than he bargained for, for Jesus was revealing that he is the presence of God himself, right here in front of Caiaphas. And and if what he says is true, Caiaphas is now trying to condemn to death God's very own son, the Messiah. If what Jesus said is true, Caiaphas is in a very nasty place. What does a person do when they discover that they are on the wrong side of God himself? It's a question every man has to answer. What does a person do if you find you're on the wrong side of God himself? What does Caiaphas do? Well, we're told he tore his robes. He stood up and wrecked a good suit, which he technically wasn't supposed to do, I think, but he did it as a sign that he totally rejected what Jesus had just said as blasphemous. 
and he called for judgment. What are we going to do with this guy who makes this audacious claim? And he pronounced the death sentence. What, what does he deserve? He deserves death, Matthew says, in, recorded here. And then in verses 67 and 68, you get a weird little combination because they immediately start beating Jesus up. As soon as they hear Jesus making this audacious claim, they immediately start beating him up. They spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? So this is one huge, abusive, visceral visceral (laughs) reaction to Jesus Christ. When I find out who Jesus is, it raises up within me the strongest of reactions coming right from my very insides. And in this case, it was, an a, it was a reaction of rejection. No, we do not accept what you are saying, who you say you are. Discovering who Jesus really is and what he is really like will produce in natural man the most powerful, violent, visceral reaction that one can have. Why do people get so angry with Jesus? Why do they reject Jesus? Why do they persecute the church? This is it right here. They're having the same reaction to Jesus that Caiaphas did. In this case, it was a very negative reaction. Now, it doesn't have to be negative. You remember one of the disciples named Thomas? Thomas wasn't sure about who Jesus was either. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to him. And let me just read you that story to show you a positive reaction. In John chapter 20, verses 26 to 29, we read this. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace. Be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. These were the wounds from the cross, right? The nails, the spear. Jesus says, Thomas, come here and check this out. I'm showing you who I really am. And He says to Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet yet have believed. So you see, Thomas is having this same reaction that Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin had, only it's positive. He sees Jesus, finally realizes who he really, really is, and he drops to his knees in worship, in submission, and in faith. Powerful reactions. You cannot discover who Jesus really is without having a powerful reaction. You know, it's easy to believe in Jesus when you think he's just sort of a normal nice guy out there to encourage us in life and help us a little. But when we discover his true identity, right hand of power, coming in the clouds, master and king, judge over all the earth, when you discover who Jesus really, really is, our true reaction immediately comes out. Either it's Get out of here, Jesus, I don't want anything to do, or it's bow down and worship. What kind of reaction have you had to Jesus Christ? Positive or negative? If you are just so-so about Jesus, maybe it's because you've never really been confronted with who he really is and what he's really like his true identity. But, unfortunately, now you have. I've just told you. It's time for your 
powerful reaction. Which way are you going to go? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. May we be led in our faith to discover just who he is, O oh Lord. Just why you've sent him into our lives and just how we need to give ourselves to him. Help us to have that positive, powerful reaction to our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Bob, for bringing the Word of God to us in such a powerful way this morning. Pastor Bob is going to come back and uh, do the doxology uh, again here in a moment, kind of in a special way, so we look forward to that. But before he does, allow me to uh, extend to you the blessing from God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We're going to do the uh, doxology just a little bit different today because uh, of a couple of reasons you don't need to worry about, but uh, uh, sing loud, we'll try to get through it, okay? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise 